Do you think I made Eric wear a little suit there? <laughs> Look how cute they are. Look at them all dressed up as a White Sox fan. Little superheroes. Yeah. We sent our kids to a Catholic school. First communion. Yeah. We both worked. We're still married. Eric is a Cub Scout. You know, we were middle class, and I tried to raise my kids right, and you can do everything right. Mm -hmm. And things go off the rails. Bad things happen to good people. Someone told me that once, and I thought, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and run with it. <laughs> Bad things can happen to good people. My husband and I grew up on the southwest side of the city. Same neighborhood. We lived two blocks apart. So we started dating in high school and got married right after I graduated. We bought a house right in the neighborhood we grew up in. All our friends lived there. So it was great. And we were married probably three or four years before we had Eric. As a small child, he was really caring about other people. Kind of used to scare me because he would really look out for other people. And I just always thought, oh gosh, he just seems too sensitive. Like sometimes sensitive boys don't do well in school. They do well maybe academically, but maybe not socially. Because he was small and he was smart and he didn't want to be the skinny, nerdy guy, which now maybe that would be a cool thing to be. He didn't want to be smart. He just wanted to be like one of the cool guys. That was his kind of his, uh, I guess, his thing. Freshman year, he goes to school. First few months are fine. He takes the bus. And on the bus is Nick. And Nick's a junior, and he's cool. You know, he has an earring, and he's 16, and Eric's 14. And he takes Eric under his wing, recruits him into the gang. So now he joins this almighty Pope gang. Like, these were all older kids. Eric's 15. They're like 19, 20, 21. They're buying him alcohol. And when you join a gang, you know, they become your family. As you know, as an adolescent, and they give him your respect, and they're there, and they welcome him and accept him. And they had a lot of things at school about how to recognize if your child's in a gang, which is great. But there was no follow-up as in, what do you do if you recognize your child's in a gang? Where do you go? Who do you see? I brought him to see a psychiatrist, and they're like, he's fine. There's nothing wrong with him. All the kids that he was hanging around with, that he was forbidden to hang around with, start showing up at the house. And if I'm home, I'm like, you can't come in. You don't come by my house anymore. Not that that stops a 15-year-old from sneaking out or doing whatever he's doing. And you're going to work. And December 14th rolls around, and Eric's with those kids. You know, a lot of it's, a lot of it's a blur. You know, I, I just don't remember. You know, you would think like, this is the day, right? This is the day that literally changed everybody's lives, my life, my family's lives, those girls, their families, everybody in that neighborhood. This is the day. So you would think every detail has to be etched into your brain. You could, how could you ever forget that? But the truth is, I don't remember a lot of it. You know, I was, uh, I was in a bad place, you know, and uh, I was doing a lot of stupid things with my time. I met up with a friend of mine at the time, and uh, we ended up breaking into a house and found two guns there. And we had been having run-ins in our neighborhood with another group of guys. And we decided to go and see if these guys were parked outside of this park. The van that we had known them to be in was there, started to pull away. I, uh, 
I fired a gun at the van, and uh, two innocent people were killed, two girls. And, uh, you know, that's something I can never take back. I view it now, today, as a 39-year-old trying to understand what a 15-year-old idiot was thinking about. And as small and as worthless as it is, the main thing I always thought about when I was 15 was, what are my friends going to think? What are they going to think? You know? So that is what was going through my head, you know? Like, I have to show these people. I have to show my friends. You know, I have to look as cool and as tough as I possibly can, you know? And that shit sucks. That's a shitty, horrible, non reason for everything that happened. I was uh, as a police officer. I was a tactical officer out of the gang crimes unit. That night, we were working on at 11th and State. And uh, the guy I work with, we were both from the same neighborhood. And he says, my wife just called me, told me there was uh, two girls shot over by the school. And uh, I says, I was kidding with her. I says, yeah, watch it be somebody we know or something. You know, wouldn't that be something? It had to be about 3.30, 4 in the morning when the police were banging at the door. I wanted to detect this was one of my old partners. And I opened her and said, hey, what's up? And he goes, Rick, we got to come in. I need to talk to you. And then he tell, tells me, he says, yeah, we think your son was involved and all that stuff. Is he here? And then I said, oh, yeah, he's here. I'm upset, but I'm thinking, well, this is kind of good. You know, let's get down to the station, get this all straightened out, and get my kid back in bed, and, you know, me back in bed, and, and that'll be it. He was in a holding cell. And as a professional courtesy, they let me and him sit at a desk and talk. I told him, I says, listen, I need to know what's going on. And I want you to tell me what happened and all that stuff. And he just says, Dad, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. And then, you know, I kind of knew. It's hard to explain, but through the whole trial and everything, my head was spinning. All I kept thinking is, these poor victims are sitting there, you know, they lost their, their daughters, and, you know, I just couldn't think straight. I was very shocked by the trial. I'll be honest with you, I grew up blue-collar family, never really had any run-in with the law. Kind of thought that the justice system worked and that this is the best there is. And then once I was thrown in it, it was very disappointing. The only charge they allowed was first degree murder. And if he was found guilty, it was gonna be life without parole. Didn't matter what we said or anybody said, there was nothing to account for his age or anything. Well, he's given life without parole, meaning, meaning just that, that he would die in prison. I consider that a, a, a death sentence, just a slow one. Yeah, it was pretty devastating. Eric had the sentence, but really I always feel like the whole family serves it. We never talked about the future. We never said, oh, maybe someday you'll get out and we can do this, or maybe just off limits. Never, ever talked about the future. So there's this huge just blackness in front of you. There's a way people react to adverse situations. I've seen the whole gamut of how people react. Some people break, some people, you know, uh, just go down a dark hole and never come back. And uh, I'm so happy that everyone could come today. And some people so do what my mom did, take it and turn it into as much positivity as can possibly be mustered from a super horrible situation.